So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, prompting based continued learning. So it's actually a joint work with uh, Google researchers. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Okay. Um, well, uh, let's recap from a basic concept of continued learning. So we all know that human beings have a natural ability to adapt to different tasks uh, sequentially without forgetting what they have learned uh, during the learning process. And humans can also seamlessly leverage knowledge learned from past tasks uh, to tackle future tasks. And uh, this ability is called continual learning. And we also have this motivation uh, in real world applications because the world is actually not static. Uh, for example, we want to train a robot to do object recognition, and we naturally would like, would like it to learn from all kinds of environments. So first of all, we may put the robot into a zoo uh, to do animal recognition, and then we may move the robot to a garden to do flower recognition. And then we may uh, again put the robot into a different environment farm to do fruit recognition and so on and so forth. So we finally want the robot to be able to recognize all of the things uh, it has ever seen, uh, including animals, flowers, and fruit. Um, and that is called uh, continual learning or lifelong learning for uh, machine learning systems. So um, let's come to a more formal uh, definition of continual learning. So in continual learning, we basically have a single model uh, plus a sequence of tasks. So on the right, uh, on the left, you can see um, what is the uh, uh, like usual IID supervised learning we have. Actually, we don't have the idea of different tasks in um, conventional supervised learning. Uh, instead, we would like to mix all the tasks together as a single training set, and we simply train it on the uh, IID set, and finally test on a single test set. Which, is, um, which has the same distribution as our training set. But in continued learning, things are quite different. So um, at each time step, we will, uh, our model only has like access to a single task. Uh, for example, we first of all, we train our model on the first task called task one, and then, uh, after, and then when the model transferred to task two, uh, we don't have access to uh, task one anymore, and so on and so forth. So during the, continued learning process. The, uh, for example, here's like a neural network model. Uh, the different weights learns like different importance uh, to different tasks. So the knowledge is kind of uh, mixed up together. And uh, when a single model is trained on all the tasks, we finally evaluate the uh, final model uh, using all tasks. However, there's a main challenge in um, continued learning called uh, catastrophic forgetting meaning that the performance uh, of a machine learning system on all tasks deteriorates, deteriorates uh, drastically after learning new tasks. For example, if you see the uh, figure here, uh, after learning on task one, um, the robot or the machine learning system got very good performance on the first task, but when transferred to task two and only trained on task two, it also learned very well on task two, but the performance of task one, you can see here, um, it's like uh, more than half. And finally, when, when it trains on task three, it got very bad performance on both task one and task two. So um, this kind of performance drop on previously learned tasks uh, is called uh, a catastrophic forgetting in continued learning. Uh, here are several mainstream solutions uh, to, tackle uh, to tackle catastrophic forgetting in continued learning. So namely, there are uh, regularization-based method meaning that we want to put some constraint on important parameters uh, with respect to all tasks. Um, however, this kind of methods all, always like suffer from unsatisfactory performance and they're kind of like earlier works. And here also the so-called rehearsal-based method, meaning that you can maintain a small uh, memory buffer to save past data from previous tasks, uh, which is very intuitive actually. Uh, however, you can imagine that when you have actually a very small buffer size and uh, you can only say, for example, one example per, per task, uh, the performance will become very bad. And also here are some data privacy issue actually, uh, when you are not allowed to save any past data, then this kind of method 
uh, become unavailable. And finally, we have the architecture-based method, meaning that for uh, each task, we'll maintain a uh, task-specific component. And um, uh, this kind of architecture-based method often requires um, task identity at test time, because you know that we have different task-specific components during training, but during test, uh, when a random example comes, we would like to know which task specific component to use. So we uh, actually require task ID at test time. Uh, and often uh, when the task specific components is, um, um, is very uh, less, uh, has some like substantial amount of parameters and you have like more and more uh, tasks during your continued learning process, uh, you will actually introduce a, like a large number of uh, parameters and this kind of methods uh, uh, are actually not scalable uh, in the long run. So what, what kind of the intuitions uh, behind these three different methods? Well, it's actually that the core idea of them is all um, preserving learned knowledge during continued learning. So uh, regularization-based method uh, constraints uh, important parameters for all tasks uh, in order to preserve knowledge in important parameters for each task. And rehearsal-based method, kind of trying to preserve knowledge in buffer data for each task. And the architecture-based method use task-specific components uh, as proxies for uh, task-specific knowledge. So um, can we somehow come up with a more efficient and, and effective knowledge preservation system for continued learning? All right, so here comes our topics today. Um, so uh, let me introduce the very first work that introduces um, prompting to uh, continue learning. That is our CVPR 2022 work, uh, learning to prompt for continue learning. So in this work, we address multiple continue learning challenges. Um, our method actually does not require a uh, rehearsal buffer to perform well. And it also doesn't require uh, task time, uh, task identity to make the prediction. And it actually is compatible to various continued learning settings, uh, including the most difficult uh, task agnostic setting, meaning that there's no uh, clear task boundary uh, when you do training or testing. And the prompting parameters actually introduced uh, to our method is very small, meaning that our method is actually very memory efficient. And here are some highlights of our method. Um, so L2P is actually the first uh, to introduce the idea of prompting to continue learning. And it achieves uh, state-of-the-art performance under multiple continued learning settings. And uh, even we, when we remove the rehearsal buffer uh, to it, it can still achieve um, competitive uh, results. OK, so uh, L2P actually introduces a very novel continued learning paradigm um, that is totally different from uh, previous continued learning method. So uh, if you, I, I would like to like summarize the core idea of L2P is that L2P uses learnable prompts to instruct the pre-trained backbone model to learn different tasks. So for example, if you look at the uh, figure on the left, uh, it's actually the learning paradigm of the mainstream rehearsal or replay-based method. Um, so at the uh, nth task, we have like a, a data buffer and we have the data from the, the current task. And we're trying to mix up the old uh, buffered example with the uh, example from the current data in a single mini batch and trying to update the model. So we're uh, kind of trying to update the model all the way, meaning that uh, the model parameters gets updated uh, at every task. So um, this kind of uh, forgetting uh, inev inevitably happens. And in our method, uh, we kind of change this fine tuning paradigm to the so-called prompt selection and prompt tuning. Uh, meaning that we, we actually have like a well-pre-trained uh, backbone at the very beginning, and we keep its weights uh, frozen all along the uh, continued learning. And uh, at the task, N, we kind of 
uh, trying to uh, form some kind of query from the uh, example and trying to use the query to select uh, the most relevant prompt uh, in the pool or in a set of prompts. So that we can try to get the get some of the prompt parameters out of it and use that to instruct the frozen backbone to make reasonable prediction. And we only train the prompt parameters inside the prompt pool uh, instead of uh, fine tuning the whole model. So that is why we're very different from the um, like traditional uh, continuous learning methods. Okay, let's get uh, some background uh, knowledge first. So uh, what is prompting? Actually, the idea of prompting uh, stems from uh, the field of natural language processing. It's called uh, the fixed instructions to input. For example, in figure A, uh, we have the well-known uh, mass language model pre-training to the language model. And um, uh, each mass language model head or MLM head is trying to predict the missing word uh, in uh, like full sentence. So they're actually trying to um, like make a, uh, it's like a, you have a huge classification problem that you, you need to uh, choose one of the word uh, from a huge uh, vocabulary. And on the right, uh, uh, figure B, you're, you're actually trying to solve like a, a downstream task. Uh, for example, here, you, you, you would like your pre-trained model to solve a uh, sentence sentiment classification problem. So uh, normally you would like to train a, a very different model with a different classification head so in this sense, you only need to um, classify your sentence into two kinds of labels. One is positive and one is negative. So it's a simple binary classification problem. So basically your MLM pre-training and fine-tuning are actually doing two different things, although they share the same backbone. So uh, the prompting-based technique is actually trying to uh, align MLM pre-training and your uh, fine-tuning process. So uh, in the pre-train, uh, in the um, prompting based idea, you actually have the same input here. So for example, here, there's no reason to watch and you have like an additional uh, template called uh, prompt here. Uh, so the prompt is, it was mask. So you actually transfer your uh, original sentiment classification problem uh, into a like mass language model word prediction task. For example, here, you have a like a MLM head here. You need to predict the missing word here. So uh, you can, uh, you can like, uh, like one of the prediction might be, uh, might make sense here is like, it is either great or terrible, which is from the uh, big vocabulary size you have. And great actually means uh, the positive sentiment and terrible actually means negative sentiment. And, Actually, you can you can make like a, a more than this great and terrible predictions. For example, you can uh, predict good, bad, this kind of words. So basically, when you have the prompt, your actually fine tuning stage is more like the uh, MLM uh, prediction task. Okay. So, uh, well, one drawback of the the prompting technique is actually you, you need to design different prompts to make it uh, to make it work. For example. It was, it, it was, might be a like reasonable choice here. But also you can also ask, uh, for example, ask a question, what's your feeling about the film or whatever? So you will need to try out different templates. So in order to solve this um, like human engineering problem in prompting, uh, people propose like another uh, like alternative for it. It's called prompt tuning or soft prompting. So instead of plugging some predefined sentences or questions to your input, you actually can make your prompt uh, learnable parameters. So basically when you have like a pre-trained uh, language model uh, doing pre-training, you actually can uh, make, make all the, uh, make the uh, pre-trained language model uh, totally frozen uh, during fine tuning time. And you add the so-called learnable prompt parameters to your uh, input sentence. And you only, you actually only train the, um, the learnable uh, parameters here. So the learnable prompts actually access learnable instructions 
to utilize knowledge in the uh, pre-trained language model. Uh, and it has been very successful uh, in transfer learning and the performance of Chrome tuning is actually uh, comparable to full model fine tuning. So uh, inspired by this idea, we actually can leverage it in our continued learning scenario because um, as you can imagine, the prompt actually encodes uh, instructions that is uh, very task specific to the uh, downstream task. And in our continued learning scenario, we actually have a sequence of tasks. So uh, we can actually leverage the idea uh, of prompting in our continued learning. Okay, so how can we do that? We have like a very nice uh, overview in animation. So, um, well, thanks like, um, like, like our, uh, my mentor in Google to uh, create this animation for me. Um, and uh, for, uh, for example, let me uh, give you like a brief introduction of like how it works. So we have actually the uh, input from different tasks here, and we have the so-called shared prompt pool here. So the actual idea is that you can produce some query here that is input related, and you can match the query with some of the prompt parameters in the whole pool so that uh, actually different input chooses like a different set of prompts to use. And then you can prepend your um, uh, prompt parameters to your uh, input embedding and then feed it to your pre-trained transformer encoder and the classifier for the final prediction. Okay, let's take a closer look at how it actually works. So for example, here, you have the input and we have defined a query function. So actually you can kind of map your input to some of the uh, latent key space. For example, we would like the key to actually capture or characterize the most uh, like salient feature of the input. For example, you can use like a pre-trained ResNet or pre-trained transformer here to, uh, to actually uh, extract the key information. So in our paper, we actually used the uh, pre-trained transformer encoder. So we actually reuse it here for encoding our key. And we have defined a prompt pool, which is a shared memory space that is shared by uh, all the tasks. And you can see here, each uh, circle here is actually um, like contains like two things. It's actually a key value pair. So you have a key here and you, you have the value which represents the prompt parameters. So basically what are you doing here is you're trying to map the key to the most uh, like similar keys in the prompt pool. And then once again, the matches, you can actually um, select out the corresponding values or the prompts and trying to prevent the select prompts to your um, inputting embeddings here. So why would we like to do that? Uh, so, okay, let's show this first. So for example, you have uh, input one and input two. For example, they're um, uh, kind of similar to each other, right? So you can uh, map your input one to your uh, key, key one, and you can map your input two to key two. So our ultimate goal is that when two inputs are very similar to each other, they tend to share the same of the um, prompt selections in the prompt pool. While they're, when they're very different, they tend to share a very different sets of prompts so that the uh, catastrophic forgetting or the knowledge interference will become minimal in the prompting space. So for example here, K1 and K2, two keys, actually choose the same shared prompt here, meaning that the shared prompt actually encodes, well, implicitly, some of uh, generic features or generic instructions. while um, you can see here, K1 and K2 also trying to uh, choose some unshared prompts, uh, which is, uh, well, relatively more uh, task specific features. And during training, we actually trying to uh, make, make the keys in the prompt pool trainable. For example, uh, we, we, we have the like cosine similarity between the, uh, the input key and the learnable key in the prompt pool. So that our objective is trying to pull the matched 
keys to get uh, closer to the correct key. So that whenever next input comes, that is similar to this input, it will, uh, tends to be matched to the uh, same set of prompts. So that is actually a high level idea of how we do um, like key value paired matching uh, in the prompt pool space. Okay, so the actual uh, objective, learning objective of, of L2P actually uh, contains two parts. The first one is actually uh, the um, uh, conventional classification loss, for example, cross entropy that tries to optimize the prompt parameters. And the second part is actually what I just described uh, to match the learnable keys in the prompt space to your input key. Uh, so gamma here is actually the uh, some similarity metric. For example, we use cosine similarity in our um, uh, a, a cosine distance uh, in our paper. Okay. Yeah, let's do some experimental results here. Uh, we can go it very quickly. Uh, so here are two representative um, class incremental um, uh, tasks in uh, benchmarks in continuous learning. Uh, this is the uh, split C500 and this is the five data set, which is like, um, uh, like each task is coming from a very different data set from CIFAR 10 to uh, not amnist. So uh, we can see here, L2P actually outperforms like all the corresponding methods uh, equipped with the uh, same buffer size from uh, methods that are compatible with no buffer size to um, methods that are, that needs like a certain amount of buffer size uh, from like very small zero to uh, relatively large. And we can see uh, what is no, uh, worth noting is that uh, when even there's no buffer, L2P actually uh, is very uh, competitive. Like uh, for example, uh, on split C500, it can achieve like uh, 83.8, which is very actually very close to uh, L2P with a relatively large buffer. And uh, the performance is even very close to uh, all the rehearsal-based method with a relatively large buffer size, meaning that our design of the prompt pool actually retains like a, a very good old, uh, like a rep knowledge representation of old tasks uh, in the continued learning uh, uh, procedure. Okay, also we have, we also have like achieved very strong performance on the so-called domain incremental task, uh, meaning that for uh, each task, uh, the um, the examples are actually from the same set of classes, but they actually are very different. Uh, there's so-called the domain gap. Uh, so in this sense, we our L2P plus like a relatively large buffer size uh, is very close to the upper bound performance, uh, which means that we just train it on the, uh, we mix up all the um, uh, tasks together and do it on the uh, conventional supervised learning scenario. And here's like a very uh, interesting experiment called uh, task agnostic setting. So here's the so-called Gaussian schedule of the uh, tasks. So at uh, the x-axis is actually the uh, the batch ID or the time you can you can think of as this, and the y-axis is actually uh, the class distribution of uh, 10, 10 classes, uh, for example. Uh, but here we actually do now C five hundred, so they're actually uh, many, many more task uh, classes. And at each time point, you can see here the task, uh, the class distribution uh, like is, is shifting continuously. So you don't actually have a clear task boundary uh, in this case. So it's actually very challenging. However, all uh, L2P can still achieve very uh, competitive performance under this setting. And it's very close to the uh, upper bound. Okay, so uh, L2P actually um, gives like a, a very refreshing perspective of how to conduct continued learning. And um, we also have like a improvement upon this called dual prompt, uh, complementary prompting for rehearsal free continued learning, uh, which is like a publication in ECCV 2022. Uh, it's like a follow up work of L2P, which discusses like more uh, interesting prompting design in continued learning scenarios. So um, let's recall some 
actually limitations of L two P because well, it's the first working uh, to to do prompting in continuous learning. Uh, so first of all, you kind of maintain a single prompt pool, although you have this kind of uh, key value pair design to make more similar examples tends to choose um, the same or more similar set of prompts, but there will be uh, inevitable interference between task specific and task invariant knowledge. Uh, and there will be mismatch, of course. Uh, and also the single prompt pool, under the single prompt pool design, you actually uh, attach prompt only at the very input layer. So uh, it, it ultimately has like limited representation power to instruct your final model. A more flexible design, of course, so to like, uh, you have the freedom to put your prompt parameters at like every or like, a subset of your uh, transformer layers. And also we all uh, in L2P, we only like explore the uh, the prompt tuning style, meaning that we uh, directly prepare prompts to the input embedding tokens. That might not be the uh, best choice because in uh, natural language processing literatures, there are multiple ways of attaching prompt parameters to your uh, input embedding uh, other than the uh, direct prepending. And also uh, one uh, biggest problem is that L2P, although achieve very strong performance without rehearsal buffer, it still require like a relatively large rehearsal buffer to actually outperform a uh, rehearsal based method. So in order to do totally like uh, rehearsal free, we propose dual prompt uh, that mainly focus on uh, pushing forward the uh, uh, class incremental learning pro uh, uh, performance. So here are several highlights of dual prompt. So we have this novel design of complementary general and uh, expert prompts, uh, which learn uh, like respective, respectively different knowledge uh, from uh, the sequence of tasks. And also we have conducted a um, comprehensive study on design choices of prompting, including where and how to attach uh, the learnable prompt parameters. And we, um, uh, our uh, dual prompt beats state-of-the-art rehearsal-based method without buffer on uh, many uh, continuous learning benchmarks. And we have proposed a new, very challenging continuous learning benchmark called uh, split image, image net R, uh, which can be like an alternative for uh, image net uh, for this kind of um, big, big models that has already been pre-trained on uh, image net. Okay, so here's actually the motivation of the uh, dual prompt. Uh, it's actually from a uh, like famous uh, like theory called complementary learning systems, uh, which describes how human beings learn. So actually, in the uh, well, in the brain of our human beings, we actually have like two um, like two parts that have different responsibilities in, in the learning process. The first part actually uh, tries to learn something very fast, while the second part tries to slowly learn more uh, structured knowledge. So this kind of slow learned knowledge, we can treat it as uh, task invariant knowledge because every time we would like to learn a new task, we, we're trying to find uh, some relevant knowledge in our slow learned knowledge uh, knowledge base. And of course, when we would like to learn something new, we cannot only rely on what we have learned, right? We need to quickly capture that is uh, characteristic in the new test. So we need like a fast learning system to quickly capture um, what, what is useful to, to learn the current task. So that's why we, we need this kind of uh, complementary learning system. So um, in order to leverage this idea, a natural idea is actually trying to decouple uh, the prompting space into task specific and task invariant. Okay, so here's like our design of uh, dual prompt. So as its name suggests, we have uh, two different kinds of prompts, which is the G prompt or the general prompt. So the general prompt uh, is actually shared between all tasks. 
during the continued learning process. And the second type of prompt is the so-called e-prompt or expert prompt that is very uh, task specific. So for example, here you have uh, a sequence of T tasks. So uh, uh, correspondingly, you, you will have like T, um, T set of E prompts, which is also like key value pair. So actually the key value pair is very close to the, uh, the, um, the key value paired prompt pool in L2P. So whenever actually an input comes from a certain task, you are uh, doing the same thing using the same query function to encode the input uh, to some key space. And you're trying to match, um, match your input key to one of the mo like closest keys here. So we, uh, the key here is, is quite task specific because for, uh, we, uh, we have T tasks total and we also have like T keys here. So uh, one key actually maps to a single task. So here the input key will match to a, like a task specific key and to choose the task specific EEPROM to use. And another thing that is um, depicted in the uh, figure is actually that we can have like multiple prompts, right? So multiple prompts actually corresponds to multi-layer detaching. We can actually have prompts to be like inserted at uh, a certain range of layers. For example, uh, like for example, uh, in our paper, we have the G prompt inserted to the very first layer to the third layer. So we have done like a extensive hyperparameter research of like where to put the uh, prompts. And also similarly for input, for E prompt, so you don't have to like attach G and E prompt to the same uh, level of your uh, transformer model because well, intuitively the G prompts captures more um, task invariant knowledge or more general knowledge. So we, we, we uh, empirically find that you, you actually need to decouple G and E because you need to put G prompt into more like shallower layers of your uh, transformer. And you need to put E prompt to more like deeper layers of your um, transformer backbone to learn more uh, task specific knowledge. And also in dual prompt, we also like um, just uh, like explore a, uh, like a different uh, technique to try to uh, attach the prompt to your um, like uh, uh, to your input embedding, which is so called uh, prefix tuning. So prefix tuning is actually uh, an alternative technique to uh, prompt tuning. So in prompt tuning, you actually uh, direct prepare your G uh, your prompt. So for example, I, I just use G prompt here for example. But in practice, uh, we use the same um, like prefix tuning or prompt tuning uh, for both G and E. So I just like use G as an example here. So uh, in prefix tuning, you actually only prepend the G prompt to your um, key and value here. So actually where, where uh, the key and value here is not the same as uh, the, 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 the prompt key, but uh, we are actually trying to characterize the uh, self-attention here. So recall that in self-attention, you replicate your uh, input to three same copies, right? You have the query, you have the key, and you have the V uh, value here. So we basically only attach our prompts into the uh, key and value um, replicates of your input. So that after you actually calculate the, uh, the length of your output, this kind of operation can, can make your um, output length be the same as the input length. Meaning that even if you attach the prompts to multiple layers, your final output will remain the same. Well, on the contrary, if you um, directly prepend your prompt to your input embedding. Uh, and if you do it layer by layer, you'll, you'll, you'll finally increase your um, uh, output length like linearly uh, when you have like more and more layers that have prompt attached. So we empirically find this prompt tuning strategy very useful when you, when you develop this uh, multi-layered prompting technique. Okay. So here's like actually a comparison between dual prompt uh, 
uh, versus learn to prompt. So um, in dual prompt, we have like G and E prompt, which is different from the uh, prompt tool design. And uh, by this kind of design, we can actually decouple the attaching position of general and expert prompts. Instead of in L2P, we can actually uh, only attach the prompt in, in the uh, input layer. And we develop multi-layer deep prompt versus the single layer prompt in L2P. And we have this kind of prefix tuning style attaching, which maintains the uh, length of your um, uh, output embedding the same along the, the way of, of doing prediction uh, versus the prompt tuning style uh, attaching, which ultimately increases your uh, uh, embedding size. Okay. So uh, we all, uh, in order to um, show that our method is um, uh, uh, has has great performance, we introduce like a more challenging uh, CL benchmark called uh, Split Image Net R. So it has ten tasks, uh, where each task uh, contains twenty classes. It's very close uh, to real world scenarios because you can see here inside each class you have like different styles of the basically the same thing. But they are like very, very different. Well, one is very uh, well lifelike, and the other one is more animated. So uh, it is very useful to uh, to evaluate uh, ImageNet pre-trained models because actually these examples are a majority of them are not from ImageNet, and they um, uh, it it also includes like a very uh, the most difficult part of the ImageNet dataset, and also. Uh, it will be very challenging for the rehearsal based method because when the intro class diversity is huge, you need to save more and more uh, data actually to the buffer to make it work because a single example cannot uh, characterize the, the whole uh, class that well when you have like significant intra class diversity. Okay. Here's actually an experiment uh, con conducted on the uh, image net net R, um, comparing the like uh, red square is our dual prompt and um, we said like a series of uh, rehearsal based method. So on the X axis, it's actually the uh, additional memory size. So in order to uh, like conduct a fair comparison, we we're trying to translate all the additional memory size uh, into the number of uh, 224 times 224 uh, images. Uh, that is more convenient to compare because they are like uh, replay this method. And we can see here the all the replay or rehearsal based method is like a relatively large buffer size to actually perform well or perform at the similar level of our dual prompt. And when when it has like very tiny buffer, the performance of them actually um, like drops very huge in this sense. So yeah, that is also aligns well with uh, our like new uh, split image that are uh, then set. And also we can see here, all the designs contributes well to enhance L2P uh, to, to our dual prompt in this point. So we have like a significant gap between our like, uh, like the previous version of our prompting based technique in continue learning. And also we have compared dual prompt with a series of architecture-based method because, well, actually in the review process, a lot of reviewers actually think of, well, not a lot of, but one or two of the reviewers think of, um, well, a dual prompt or L2P as a kind of architecture-based because we uh, the prompting parameters uh, we can think of it as task specific. Uh, however, I want to I would like to point out the uh, actual difference here because the prompting parameters actually only takes like a very tiny bit of uh, additional um, memory here. Uh, for example, all the um, architecture based method actually adds like a significant amount of uh, additional parameters here. And also, uh, and uh, in, in contrast, our method only adds like less than one percent of the total parameters, meaning that we're we're not trying to um, learn good representations by adding prompts, but we're trying to uh, 
learn good instructions contained inside the prompts. So which is like a totally different paradigm. And also we can see here the, the, the comparison is actually not that fair because uh, in prior words, uh, uh, actually in the continuing field, uh, things are not quite uh, fair at, at that point because people uh, uh, learn, uh, well, leans to uh, design their uh, different uh, evaluation settings. So here actually some of the uh, architecture based method even has like a uh, buffer size, a uh, replay buffer attached with them as well. Uh, but uh, overall, our uh, we had the, the, the best um, average accuracy uh, as well as the uh, smallest uh, additional parameter and no buffer size here. Okay, here's actually a very um, uh, interesting visualization of the G and E prompts, uh, because intuitively we would like the E prompts to learn uh, some task specific knowledge and the G prompt to learn more uh, invariant knowledge. And uh, on the upper part is actually the E prompts from different tasks. So, well, this is like a TSNI visualization. So they're relatively well uh, separated in the latent space, meaning that it actually captures more uh, task specific knowledge while uh, on the lower part is actually the trajectory of G prompt during the training process. Uh, because we only have like one uh, set of shared prompts that is shared by all the tasks. So we, 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 we do not have like a separate G prompts and we can only show the, uh, the learning trajectory of G at the end of each task. We can see here, the trajectory of G prompt is actually quite centered meaning that during the whole learning process, it only moves very slowly in the latent space, um, indicating that we're actually learning very uh, invariant knowledge contained in the G prompt. Okay, uh, and here comes the final conclusions and future directions of the talk. So, um, well, L2P actually first introduces prompting to the continuum learning field. Uh, with novel prompt pool and key value paired query mechanism design. And dual prompt further improves the design of prompts by proposing uh, complementary general and expert prompts. And, and we conducted comprehensive study about where and how to attach prompts. Uh, both methods uh, do not require rehearsal buffer nor task time task identity to uh, perform well, and both achieve state-of-the-art performance on multiple continuing settings and benchmarks. And we propose like challenging sp split image net uh, R benchmark for future research. Uh, and here's some interesting future di directions, by the way. Uh, we, first of all, we can generalize prompting-based continuing learning to more architectures, for example, convolutional neural networks, because both L2P and dual prompts are actually uh, designed for transformer-based models. And we can, do, uh, do it for like different domains instead of image classification, for example, natural language processing. And another interesting topic in continuing learning is actually uh, efficiency in continuing learning, uh, especially on the resource limited scenarios. And efficiency actually, we, we doesn't uh, uh, like conduct the like efficiency study in our L2P or dual prompt. So it, it is very interesting to see how we can leverage uh, we can how we can deploy real continued learning systems uh, into resource limited platforms. And we have like a different line of work called Sparkle, uh, which actually discusses about how we can do continued learning on edge devices. And uh, we can also explore more real world uh, use cases for continued learning. For example, uh, L2P has actually been used in a Google Cloud product to address forgetting for periodically updated models. And we can actually find more and more uh, use cases in, in real world applications. Um, all right. And uh, we have like additional resources for you if you are uh, interested in our research. We have like a GitHub repo that's open source and we have like a Google AI block uh, that introduces L2P uh, in more details. All right, thank you everybody for listening.